Hey, good evening, everybody. As always, I hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone enjoyed their day. I know some people starting school, um, some of the kids all over the country. So I just want to uh, give a shout out to those starting school that, you know, um, I hope everyone had a good first day and getting back into the swing of things. I know a lot of people are doing virtual um, and not in the classroom per se. So I know it's a little struggle for some, but I uh, want to wish those uh, good luck this week on school. Uh, as always, thank you for those who's been tuning into the channel, um, those who's been supporting the call, supporting the, uh, the the information that I've been putting out, um, spreading around, getting it to people that needs to hear it, empower those to advocate and to speak out in the community, especially with all that's going on. So again, thank you as always for support. Please continue to share. All I ask is just empower and spread this information and, uh, and continue to uh, spread the agenda of knowledge of what's going on in our community so we can make things better. For those who are new to the channel, welcome. We're building Community Trust, the site is dedicated to those, um, to the events that was going on, to getting knowledge, to spreading knowledge about law enforcement law, um, the things that's going on in our current events. And all I ask it before again is just to share this information. So we're going to continue on with the exclusionary rule teaching. Um, this is part two. Um, we're going to talk about the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. I'm going to kind of review the exclusionary rule and, and definition context, and then we're just going to go into it. I'm trying to make this video too long, but as always, I want to kind of really uh, hone in on some uh, key factors of this of the doctrine and why it's so important and what it doesn't matter for you and how does law enforcement use it uh, to eventually it's a benefit for them and for the court criminal justice system as a whole. So we talked about exclusionary rule uh, to pretty much get evidence inadmissible in court if it was not derived from evidence that was illegally obtained. That's the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment protects us against uh, legally searches and seizures. Um, pretty much the officer takes evidence uh, without a warrant or illegally takes that evidence and try to use it in court or put it in evidence that exclusionary rule is designed um, from Matt versus Ohio to prevent that from happening. So I did the video last uh, last teaching, so I'm going to just kind of touch on some of that stuff as far as um, just the importance of the exclusionary rule. Why is it so important to understand that this rule exists and why is it important that we know about it? Because, again, um, one of the biggest things police officers use is, is, you know, the warrant. You know, we talk about your home, searching your vehicle. Well, warrants need to be issued to search and in the context of that warrant, what it what is entailed. And a lot of times when officers get warrants, they go off probable cause. To get that warrant, they bring it to a magistrate or to a, a judge, and they they get the, uh, they have to review the evidence and make sure it's a warrant is actually uh, legitimate to use to search for that evidence to get the uh, perpetrators and make sure they go to, to jail. So the exclusionary rule, it was uh, the Matt versus Ohio. I went over, you can go back to the last video and kind of touch on it. But it talks about how... Um, it was uh, one of the victims or perpetrators, whatever you want to call it. They had evidence. It was legally seized, and it went through court, and it was a lot of different issues with how the evidence was obtained, and then that's when the exclusionary rule was developed. Um, the fruit of poisonous tree doctrine is just is pretty much is this like for the exclusionary rule, it goes hand in hand. So it say the evidence was obtained, anything within that scope, is also considered an invisible to court. And definition is it, it extends the exclusionary rule to make evidence admissible, inadmissible in court if it was derived from evidence that was illegally obtained. As the metaphor suggests, the ev evidential tree is tainted, so is the fruit. So you got a tree, tree bears fruit. If that evidence was obtained illegally, anything after the fact, anything obtaining from that case or from that uh, a legal search, a seizure of the evidence is also inadmissible. Um, it was established by the Silver, Silver Thorn Lumber Company versus the United States in 1920. Basically, it was a, a, lit, a litigation case. And it was basically talking about um, the CEO of the company was arrested for $250, contempt of court, ordering the CEO that he should be imprisoned. A bunch of evidence came out, was illegally obtained. And Come to find out from all the rulings, because the case is long, but you, I, I can put it on the page. You can review it and see the case for yourself. Basically, there was a lot of evidence obtained illegally, and basically from all the the government realized that it made a mistake, and in the way it was obtaining evidence. This is in 1920, so this is kind of when things are fresh. There was a lot of trial and error, 
and eventually they uh, the government recognized or the federal law enforcement agencies recognized that that the evidence was not uh, the, the criminal justice system was kind of flawed in the sense of stuff not being properly documented and also probably not obtained through evidence through warrants and all those things and it ruled as a it ruled out the case as um, far as the evidence against it and even in some cases if you read through the case itself it was certain things key points where um, some of the subpoenas and some of that stuff was also looked at the process of it and that some things did stick in court and some things didn't so that kind of all derived the, the, the uh, this this doctrine for the fruit, the fruit of poisonous tree where it had to be looked at and um, analyzing everything around it as far as how the evidence was, how the evidence was attained who obtained it and what process needed to be fixed so the uh, the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine and it was looked at by justice frankfurter in, in a 1939 opinion and also another case in the north dome versus united states which also is another example of um where the fruit of poison street doctor applied three things three uh key factors was looked at um number one it was discovered from a source independent of illegal activity so i took some time to break down source independent of illegal activity i gave an example is an officer obtains evidence illegally different agencies such as federal law enforcement through another crime example drug charge uh, uh, say the uh, officer pulled over someone basic minor traffic violation or a severe traffic vi uh, severe traffic drug violation they run the tags they find two outstanding warrants uh, one with drugs right they, they that could be example of of a fruit of poison tree would not be, basically would not work Deriving from a source independent of legal activity is something another crime happens outside of the, the original crime. And they, like you say, they catch you on a minor traffic violation or they catch you on, on a small drug charge. And they come to find out it was something else on top of that. If they, if they already had an open case for something, something major and they find they bust you on something small and they file a warrant, you get a warrant and for something small and they find that. Um, that that the evidence that uh, criminates you for something bigger, then that 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 doctrine, the exclusionary rule, and the fruit of poison street doctrine will not apply. So that's one factor that we got to understand when it comes to this: that source independent of legal activity. So it, it doesn't matter whether it's small or big. If they catch you, was well, two different charges or one different charge outside of the of something that's already pending, and they and they, they couldn't get the evidence for something pending. But they find evidence for something smaller, then they can they can and they go get a warrant and they find that the evidence that's even though it's not pertaining to the major crime, if it's, like I said again, example, if you if you bust it for a major drug charge, and and they, um say they pulls you over in in a minor traffic violation, and they happen to get probable cause or get a warrant to search for something else, and they find those drugs that links you to the prior case or prior charge. That you can't use exclusionary rule or the fruit of poison, poisonous tree doctrine in that case because it's a source uh, independent of a legal activity. It's something else that caught you in the in the charge. So if you officially it's two charges, then that one charge, will, will, uh, that smaller charge, will once the evidence is found and the warrants issue, they can get you for that. <laughs> Number two, um, if the discovery was inev inevitable, so that basically is self-explanatory. If you're if you find if you if they search in your vehicle or they search in your person, they find that evidence that you know in plain it, was, it may be in plain view or it may be on your person. That's it. That's that's the second disqualifier. You can't use that in court. You can't use the exclusionary rule or the fruit of poison street doctor for that because evidence was found. You, there's none. You can. There's none. You can. Uh, you can't debate it. You can't argue it. Nothing. Third thing, it is. Um, attenuation between the legal activity and the discovery of the evidence. So this is a little lengthy. So I basically defined it as a lessening of the amount force or magnitude connection between a legal police procedure and evidence obtained to the minute in trial. So basically, in, in the best way I can explain it is the keyword at, attenuation is finding out the time and the magnitude, how important it is, how big it is, depending on how big the case is. If it's some say like a murder weapon, you know they, that's kind of of a define of an attenuation 
It's like a murder weapon. It's say like O.J. Simpson trial. It was it was attenuation between the legal activity and the discovery of the evidence. So that that also con concludes the time. How long it's been since they got the evidence found? So you got to define the key terms: attenuation, magnitude, amount of uh, force or magnitude connected between the legal police procedures. So how the officer found it, the magnitude of the case, and the time that's in between it of what they found determines whether you can either use it in court or you can't use it in court. Attenuation, that means the lessening of the amount of force or magnitude connection between a legal police procedure and evidence on, obtained to be admitted in trial and the discovery. So it's time, magnitude of the case, how, you know, if it's a murder charge or something major or a major drug charge, but you don't even have to be that big and be just a regular, it could be any type of crime charge and the time that they found it and how the officer found it. Those three factors can determine attenuation between whether the, it's going to be used in court or whether it's not used in court. Um, something else was uh, you can look at the difference between the crime happened to discovery of the evidence. Court must analyze factors to determine whether evidence gained from illegal uh, police work investigation what can be tainted will be considered admissible from its uh, initial discovery due to the legitimate purpose of suppression. So uh, that was another kind of a definition or key point that I looked at. It depends on factors, time, who, how, they, how the, uh, the evidence was found, and whether it was it's going to be suppressed, meaning not used in court, depending on what type of police work it was done, whether it was thorough, whether the reports lined up, whether um, times, dates, witness reports, full investigation, all the evidence, fingerprinting, forensics, the whole nine is complete. All that stuff goes into a factor. And then the the purpose, the legitimate purpose or importance of this evidence and whether it can be, it has to be analyzed in court and has to be analyzed through a board to see whether this thing is going to be used in court, whatever the evidence is. So those three key factors um, determine whether the exclusionary rule itself and the fruit of poisonous tree doctrine, which is basically, again, like the tree, evidence illegally found, the fruit from it, will all be used in court. It, it seems like it's very hard to prove because then there's another caveat to this, and there's a lot of cases out there. You have Matt versus Ohio. You have the Silver Thorn Lumber Company versus the United States. You have the Nardone versus the United States. You have a lot of different cases that exemplify it this doctrine to be used because this wasn't a it's not a constitutional doctrine this is something developed by the justice of court and they saw the fairness of how the government was 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 capitalizing off evidence being obtained by officers officers are, are, are sworn and, and they're they're an oath so that's where we going into the good faith exception rule so this is how officers will will could could potentially still use this in court the good of faith exception, exception to exclusionary rule is barring the use of trial evidence obtained per, pursuant to an unlawful search and seizure Fourth Amendment. If officers had reasonable good faith belief that they were acting according to legal authority, such as by relying on a search warrant that is later found to have been legally defective, the legally seized evidence is admissible. That is the key definition to the good faith exception rule. Officers trained, they are licensed, they are sworn, they are taken oath. And therefore, they have a lot of credibility to be able to be trusted to do the right thing or to be able to um, do their jobs professionally enough to where if something like this happened, where if they had to cert do evidence or uh, make sure the law is enforced, they, they, by the court, they're held to, to uh, they have more credibility to, you know, make sure evidence can be admissible. The good faith exception rule was developed for this. So although it can basically, although an officer can be wrong in the warrant or the, the magistrate, or they may have the wrong, they may have the wrong with uh, evidence or they have the, the wrong PC with the, with the fact that they believe the officers acting in good faith and they were doing their jobs professionally and correctly, that evidence is going to be admissible. Casework, Arizona versus Evans, sample of good faith exception in action. Officers relied on a search warrant that turned out to be invalid. So it was. It was, they, they went to they 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 found PC for a particular crime. Um, they they went in and went and got a search warrant. They went to the magistrate. They had the stuff looked over from the PC. They relied on it. 
and they thought it was the wrong, it was happened to be wrong, and they end up taking evidence and prosecuting the person and, and using it in court against them to get them prosecuted. Um, the thing, good faith exception rule is something to, to be mindful of because if, if, say, it happens to you where officer used the wrong warrant, this is something that you got to be able to put it put it with your, with your defense attorney, with your lawyers, and, and they should be able to flip this because, again, by just officer having a badge and being sworn, if they officers feel like the, the jury and the judge and and um and attorneys and counsel just determined that this officer had legal authority, he has legal he or she has legal authority, and that they're acting in the good faith or doing their jobs professionally, nine times out of ten that evidence is going to hold up. Um, Davis versus U.S. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that exclusionary rule does not apply when the police conduct a search in reliance on binding. Appellate precedents allowing the search. Pretty much, law the, the appellate courts they wanted the search done, so they re, they responded and in, in, in response to the courts, appellate courts, and they allowed the search to happen. And exclusionary rule, they ruled out that it does not apply due to the evidence that they were acting in good faith. Um, Illinois versus Kroll, evidence may be admissible if the officers rely on a statute that is later invalidated. Again, that does not doesn't matter. Herring versus U.S., which is another um, case that I pulled up, the court found that the good faith exception to exclusionary rule applied when police employees erred, meaning error, maintaining records in a warrant database. So Herring versus United States was interesting. I pulled it up a little bit. And basically, um, Herring had a warrant in, in, in a uh, Dale, Dale County's database. Search for incidents to the arrest yielded drugs and a gun. As, as two big felonies. It was then revealed that the warrant had been recalled a month earlier, months earlier. This information had never been entered into the database. Herring was indicted on federal gun and drug possession charges as federal law enforcement, federal courts, and moved to suppress the evidence. He went to try to suppress it, and on the ground that his initial arrest had been illegal. Assuming that there was a Fourth Amendment violation, the district court concluded that the exclusionary rule did not apply and denied it. So we got, remember, the, we talked about the courts and how um, they have levels. You have the city, local, district court. You have uh, judicial court, and you have appellate court, the court of appeals, and then you go into the federal levels of uh, um, pretty much U.S. Supreme Court. So district court concluded exclusionary rule did not apply. The Eleventh Circuit affirmed they mean they basically agreed, finding that the interesting officers were innocent of any wrongdoing, and that Dale County's failure to update the records was merely ne negligent. So again, this is important that. We understand the good faith exception rule because, again, despite of error and negligence on the part of police department, part of police admin, in this case with Herring versus U.S., that charges still stuck to Herring even though they were um, that they were wrong in, in their search and they was uh, they and, and the warrant was recalled. So that that says a lot. It says a lot that the fourth the four, uh, our Fourth Amendment rights that protects us against this stuff is still case by case. So it's important to learn these laws and learn this casework because it may be, it may happen. It probably has already happened to people to where these interesting facts of the good faith exception rule, the fruit of the poison street doctrine, exclusionary rule, all these things are, are, are important. And it's up to the, if, it's, if it ever happens to anyone, this is stuff that you bring up to your counsel. This is why you need counsel present. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have understanding of these things, you do the research um, and you, le you learn the exclusionary rule, fruit of poison, poison, fruit of poison street doctrine, learn the casework, and then bring it up to your counsel to be able to them to understand, and they should know this already, that they can fight that in court to, to have the evidence suppressed. Because again, it tells you right in black and white, good and faith exception rule, although an officer makes a mistake or not into the database, or anything, other errors or negligence that they have, evidence is still stick, person is still prosecuted. So these things are important. I'm going to post these things on the page so you can check it out and read this casework for yourself to see the outcomes and see what stuck and what didn't. Um, these rules and these different type of doctrines are, are depending on, and this is why voting is so important too, because when you vote so for Supreme Court justices, these people you put in place can make these changes, you know, and 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 that's why you got to review your candidates 
and look at the Supreme Court justice and look at these candidates and see what they stand for and when they're time because you can vote for Supreme Court justices. They, they are a part of a, uh, on the ballot. You can vote for them. So if you study and you learn about your court Supreme Court justices, they the one that makes they the one can make these changes to the doctrines. They the ones can push it, they can push it to make uh, amend these things or make changes because this is this is a direct violation of our Fourth Amendment rights. And on top of that, there's also other addendums to that to make sure that it's still violated. If you look at the good faith exception rule, it doesn't matter whether they were, the police officer is wrong, right? no matter if the police admin department is wrong, the evidence is still going to stick. So if it sticks, then what's the point of having the Fourth Amendment right when if it doesn't protect you from illegal searches and seizures? Even that includes, that should include errors from the police department, that should include errors from the, um, from the police officers when they do stuff incorrectly, that should include that. But in the name of law enforcement, in the name of criminal justice, the res especially if it's a big case, then... Um, this stuff can be bypassed, you know what I'm saying, depending on how bad the, if the heinous the crime is, or how, depending on not even so much heinous, but depending on if it's a major case or something that's really detrimental, like this person really committed a felony act or felony crime, then this stuff is thrown out the window. The evidence is going to stick, and they're going to get prosecuted, and they're going to be uh, whatever sentences they get, they get. So I kind of went through it really quick, but again, this is some of the stuff, exclusionary rule, um, designed to keep evidence inadmissible in case it was illegal search and seizures, protection of Fourth Amendment rights. Fruit of the Poison Street Doctrine um, is, like I said, the 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 um the picture painted is that the tree is poisoned, then the fruit is also poisoned, meaning that the tree is evidence is not admissible, then the fruit is also not admissible. And then we talk, talked about certain cases, and then we talked about the good faith exception rule where officer um, acting in good faith, acting on their sworn position, acting in professional of their job, evidence is going to stick in court, despite of even though they made an error, even though stuff wasn't in a database, or even though they made a mistake, or they illegally gained evidence in the wrong way, they still, it still can be admissible. So those are the three things. That's kind of what the gist of this is. Um, like I said, I'm gonna post stuff on the page. You can get full disclosure, full details. I don't want to, you know, break it all the way down to the point of every single scenario because the video will be hours long. But this is just a snapshot of basic information, um, generalized information when it comes to these things. And this is, is very basic and it's very straight. I try to make it straight line as possible that it, everybody can understand what the exclusionary rule is and what is these other uh, the fruit of poison tree, tree doctrine and the good faith exception rule. So I hope this kind of gives you some knowledge. Um, I highly suggest that you read more on the casework. Uh, you know, read the cases, read what happened, um, define the legal terms, look up the terms and see what uh, um, attenuation means and learn about El Satori and, and learn about all these different things. It'll help you get a better understanding of how law is, is, is the language. It helps you understand what is needed to to be able to break it, uh, decipher what is this casework is and how it ended up the way it did and learn the levels of courts. So you know what court has more power, what uh, what some courts can, if it's say in a district court and they, they affirmed, they say they agree, concur with the charge or with the sentencing, it goes to a, a judicial or a circuit court, they may say no and they kick it back down. Or it may get all the way to the US Supreme Court, some stuff has went all the way up to the US Supreme Court and then it got dismissed. So it, it, it's levels to how the courts work. A court of appeals, they may, they, it may get convicted, sentenced, and then it goes to the court of appeals and gets re rescinded or re or turned back around to uh, close. So it's just you got to learn the court levels and learn how they work so you can be able to um, understand how the process works when it goes to court. So I hope this lesson helps. I hope um, we got comments, questions. If I, if I got stuff, something wrong, don't hesitate to leave in the comment section. I hope this helps somebody. Please share this information because we need to notice. Surprisingly enough, a lot of people don't notice stuff and they get they get, they get caught up in a charge or someone they know get caught up in a charge and, they, and the evidence and say if they were innocent or if the evidence was illegal, uh, legally obtained, they wouldn't know because they don't know how they don't know the basics of how law works. 
they don't want to know about the exclusionary rule and what it really entails. And that it, it, it does, it doesn't always be in, go in their favor. It really depends on the other factors. It really depends on, you know, your representation too. You know, how good are they at their job to know what, how the exclusionary rule can work, if, especially if the evidence was obtained, no rights were read, Miranda rights weren't read, he violated the Fourth Amendment, and he know you know he violated the Fourth Amendment. How are you going to apply these, the exclusionary rule to your situation? How are you going to be able to use it? Can you use it? Can you, can you use it and keep evidence inadmissible? Studying the casework where you can see the uh, Matt versus Ohio, you can look at these cases, uh, Terry versus Ohio, Matt versus Ohio, you can look at this, uh, these cases and see how they turned out. And then as you learn about the casework, then you can be able to, maybe it may someone you know, you can apply it to their case or get their lawyers to get applied to their case because it, it's not always, you, it seems like the exclusionary rule doesn't work, but it does work in some cases. It just depends on how much you know and how does it apply to your particular situation or to whoever you know that's in prison from uh, the Fourth Amendment violation. Because we, we have the rights for a reason. And, and, and it may not seem like that, that it's unfair, that it doesn't apply to especially African-Americans, but they're there. And if they violate it, you need to let someone know and to speak out so we can get uh, that we can apply these uh, these doctrines that are in place. They're there. Might as well use them, but you got to know how to use them and know how they apply to each situation. So uh, that's all I have. Um, I hope this helps. Please share. Please pass this on. I hope someone um, got something out of this. You know, take some notes. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, if I got something wrong, if something's out of line, by all means, leave a message, a comment, and we'll address it. I'm, I'm full, full free to, to address any comments. Um, next, next video is going to be, I'm going to do a tribute. Um, I had one of relatives that uh, passed uh, as of a week ago. Um, we're going to talk about depression and suicide. I'm going to um, really talk, be very personable. I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. I'm going to address some things um, that may help people with trauma, that may help people with um, that are struggling with depression and just struggling because this is a hard time. These are hard times. A lot of people are really struggling. I know due to the pandemic, I know what everything's going on. Uh, I know people are struggling with, I know people personally that are having issues with work. They're, they're not working. Um, there's, it's hard to find jobs it's in some areas. So I know it's a trying time for most. So I really want to talk about depression and suicide. I'm going to share some of my experiences um, from people I know and my own personal experiences with it. And hopefully it'll help someone to be encouraged and to know that there are resources and to know that you're not alone because this is, this is, uh, losing my, one of my relatives is, is, uh, due to this type of stuff. It, uh, it really hit home and it really changed my mindset when it comes to, um, dealing with hard times. So please share, please, uh, pass this on. I, I hope someone gets out gets something out of it. Don't forget about IULs. I, I keep talking about it. I know I haven't got any major responses to it, but again, retirement, the stock market took another hit and IULs and, and business opportunities are available. If you want to set yourself up for retirement, this is the time to do it. It's, it's, it's definitely something that you need to look into, but it's, it's worth it. And I'm telling you, you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to regret uh, learning about finances, learning about IULs, index strategies, Learn how to get cash value money to not only just for your, for your family and for your loved ones, but also for um, for your future. You know what I'm saying? Again, you know, you can build a business opportunity. You know, you know, a lot of people think it's a pyramid scheme and, and I know people had opinions. But I, you know, again, doing the research and looking into it and you might see I make a decision today. But when it comes to your future and especially with solidifying retirement or solidifying something solid. So if something happens, I eat in a case where lost a family member and nothing was in place, then again, you might want to think twice having something in place for your family. So if God forbid something happens, you have something to pass on. So again, if you're interested, you got a lot of business meetings coming up on Saturday, Zoom, you know, you got to go nowhere. You can be on a Zoom call, but just take the time to think about it. Let me know if you're interested in leaving the comments below and we'll pass it on. So be blessed. Thank you. Uh, please be safe and enjoy your evening.